Hi, I'm Stan Tarrant. For decades, the fishing industry used traps to harvest salmon in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. Now let's take a look at the history of fish traps. The aboriginal people who dwelt along the Pacific Rim depended on salmon for food and trade. From Honshu Island in Japan to Central California, the people celebrated the return of the salmon each year. They treated the first fish with great ceremony and respect so that his spirit would advise his brothers and sisters to return as well. Throughout what is now Alaska and the west coast of North America, native people harvested these returning salmon. They used dip nets, spears, and primitive weirs, or traps, made by placing branches or stones across the stream bed. In Puget Sound, they used reef nets, which consisted of pairs of canoes with small nets suspended between them. The reef fishermen cut channels through the kelp to guide the fish into the nets and erected small towers from which they could spot their prey. White settlers observed the native fishing methods. Beginning in the 1880s, the experiment with the pile trap was the outgrowth of white man's methods applied to Indian experience. Techniques for building traps came from Scandinavia, from New England, and from the Canadian Maritimes, where traps or pound nets had been used for generations in the cod, herring, and salmon harvests. In Puget Sound, pile trap technology reached its zenith. Later, when Washington voters outlawed trap fishing in state waters, Puget Sound trap men and their fishing style migrated to Alaska. From southeast to western Alaska, trap fishing endured until the passage of statehood in 1958. Each trap relied on a long line of piling called the lead that extended outward from the shoreline. The piling supported a fence of trap wire that blocked the path of the salmon. The trap itself lay to seaward. Alaska trap man Fred Gunnarsson gives us a fisheye view. Well, <clears throat> if he come up around and go around shore, and the first thing he hit would be the lead. Well, he's not <clears throat> going to swim ashore, so he'll, he'll try to go around it. Well, the trap is on the outside end of it. Old timers say there were over 400 trap locations claimed on Puget Sound, although many were fished only during the big years when fish were abundant. Carl Goodbranson is among the last of the Puget Sound trap fishermen. Today, he maintains the pile trap model at the Semiamo Museum and schools tourists in the art of trap fishing. This uh, particular trap is a pile trap. It uh, fishes on the flood only. And we must assume that the, these fish are going to the Fraser River and we must assume that the river is in that direction, the tide is coming in this direction, and they're built directly ac across that tide. The fish, when they hit the lead, could go, basically, they could go either way. They could go, if they go this way, the idea of this hook is to throw them back into the lead again, where they were before. Now they're turned the other way, and they'll move up move up the lead quite slowly, searching all the time for an opening. When they get up to about this part, usually they'll start to spook. And uh, they will head out this way. That's the idea of this, which is called a jigger. When they hit that, they'll follow the jigger all the way around, and when, the, when they get to the end of it, they're back where they were before. And eventually, they're going to see this 14-foot opening, and they're going to go in through it. On the next flood, they will be all against this wall, because the tide is running this way. They are bucking into the, to the tide. And uh, they go into this, this uh, tunnel, this is this is four inches across, and uh, then they're in this. Then they'll be in this pillar. 
this is the final resting place for them anyway. And they, this is where all the railing takes place and where, where the fish end up. Now this four inches seemed like awful small, but uh, <laughs> the big skates can even go through this one. So the salmon had no trouble with it, even the biggest kings and whatever. Every fourth year there occurred what was known among cannery men as a big year, with catches far above the average. Experience taught them when to expect these heavy runs and when to prepare their trap sites and processing plants for maximum production. By the big year of 1901, most of the prime trap locations had been purchased by a handful of large fishing companies. The largest was the Salmon Cartel, the Alaska Packers Association, with dozens of trap sites and canneries at Blaine, Point Roberts, and Anacortes. Later, the Pacific American Fisheries Corporation, or PAF, of Bellingham would become an even bigger canner and trap operator, and there were numerous smaller companies engaged in packing salmon. The companies fished all of their trap sites in the big years, then shut down marginal locations when fishing was lean. To protect their idle locations, they conceived the dummy trap. Good Branson explains. If one abandoned a trap site, if you didn't uh, at least uh, put one in every seven years after that, you would lose your location. And so that's when they got on the idea of putting in the dummy trap, which was a uh, which was a phony from way back, but it was a law. And so uh, they put in a makeshift uh, spiller and a, and a small heart and uh, a tiny lead and a few piling and no jigger. Uh, when they couldn't uh, catch that one fish and time was running out, they came to the trap I was on out at Birch Point with a wash tub one day. They filled that wash tub with uh, seawater and uh, packed it away and they didn't say anything to anybody. It was kind of all secret. But my, my brother was on the lifting crew and he told me later that they had, they had gone to the other location, dumped the fish into the spiller, and then they all went and lifted the trap, took their one fish, and they were legal for seven more years. Many of the early settlers in the Puget Sound region augmented their meager farm incomes by working for the fish trap owners. Trap men worked on the pile driver crews, boat crews, or wire crews. Others worked as machinists, carpenters, blacksmiths, and the like. Women and children also found work in the canneries, usually as employees of the Chinese contractors who supplied the processing labor. Mike Goodman grew up near the canneries at Point Roberts. He started working for the China contractor at age 10. Well, the Chinese needed fish, and I was right there always around the cannery doing something. So this one Chinaman took me and says, go to work. And I went to work, and from then on, that's what I did. The time was kept, our time that we worked was kept by uh, the Chinese and everything was absolutely correct at all times, as far as I was concerned. They took me and uh, gave me food and let me eat with them in the China house. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed being with these people because they were all, every one of them, as far as I was concerned, were a gentleman, the Chinese. Later, he worked on the wire crew. I worked right from the start undoing the wire and cutting it up to where it needs. I knew just exactly from dealing with these traps how we should make these, make the wire so we can take it out and drop it and build this huge fence. And that's what we did. And we put these six foot wide, 200 feet long, some of them, the wire, and we fastened them together with what they call a hog ring. And we get the two layers of I, uh, wire and fasten them by just clamping the, these two together. Big, huge rolls of wire. Take seven, eight men to roll. 
Like all trap men, Goodman had a high opinion of this method of fishing. The fish traps were the very finest way of catching fish. They came out into the boats free of any hooks or scratches or anything. They were just absolutely perfect because they swam right into the boats, as you might say, without any operation or any problems of shooting or killing or so forth. And that's one reason that the fish trap cannery had the finest fish there could be had any place. Although processors praised the traps for their efficiency and claimed that hundreds of jobs would be lost if the traps were eliminated, fishermen hated them because they gave the canners an exclusive right to fish important areas. Traps were expensive to install and operate, and ownership was consolidated in the hands of a few corporations. Opposition mounted until trap owners had to confront a new problem, piracy. Independent fishermen discovered that you didn't have to own a trap to braille trap fish in the dark of night. In coastal communities, the trap pirates were initially viewed somewhat like Robin Hoods, who robbed from the rich for the sake of the poor. Early day trap robbery was not considered too malicious. Although some cannery men were quick to invoke sanctions, most were reluctant to do anything about the situation, and the robbers felt they were taking only fish that unfair competition had deprived them of. If trap robbing once bordered on sport, it became a shooting war after World War I, and trap owners resorted to placing armed watchmen aboard their traps. Good Branson signed on as a watchman in his early 20s. Basically, this was the type of a um, fishing shack, the trap shack that we uh, lived in. Uh, some of them were, were on traps that, that they had a night watchman and a day watchman, and they were just kind of little shacks. But this kind of a house would, was one for two watchmen. And once you got out there, which would usually be in the tail end of June, you wouldn't see land again until uh, maybe uh, the, the middle of September. So it was a long, dragged, uh, dragged out thing, especially when, when I was 21 and I got on trap, uh, APA Trap 12 in uh, Boundary Bay with the, my, my partner was, uh, was three times my age, you know, and, and uh, kid at 21, well, that's kind of hard to spend the next three months with, but uh, that's what had to take place. There was, I don't know exactly how big these were, but here's the, here's the stovepipe, and uh, there was a stove was right in this corner, a tiny table here. Uh, one bunk went this way, and the other bunk went in this way, and uh, there was room to walk between, but, there, but that's about all it was. But we lived out there and, uh, and got by. Uh, I don't know, it, it wasn't easy, but I spent a lot of time rowing around and cleaning the lead and stuff like that. And, you kind of had to make yourself busy. So that's, that's about what it was. We burned coal in the stove, and they delivered the coal to us, and that was the life of a watchman. After a few encounters with the pirates, the young fisherman acquired a dramatic means of discouraging further visits. The gun was a 4590 uh, uh, lever action uh, Winchester. And probably uh, the one used to kill the buffalo. It was that old enough to be anyway. He would throw a fearsome chunk of lead into the night, though, if there's any, any fish pirates came around. Up. <laughs> this fellow that I um, watched trap with, uh, he was afraid of fish pirates. And, and uh, when he'd hear somebody, well, he'd say, Carl, somebody out there, go out and chase them away. He'd, he'd pull the covers over his head and go back to sleep again. <laughs> but, but I used to, I, I finally got onto a scheme and, and I, I, would, uh, I would go out and talk to him and never let him up the ladder. I, I'd go up and talk to him and I'd say, uh, boy, we got a bad one inside there. He's terrible temper. I, said, I don't want to wake him up. For God, you don't make any noise and, and so on. And uh, they'd, they'd move usually. They didn't want to face that fearsome man in the bunk. During the heyday of Puget Sound trap fishing, 
The salmon industry depended on sockeye, or red salmon, from Canada's Fraser River. In 1917, the fish run suddenly declined, with disastrous consequences for fishermen. Marine biologists soon discovered the problem. A rock side at Hell's Gate Canyon four years previous had created water conditions so turbulent that few fish could reach their spawning grounds. The collapse of the sockeye runs became apparent in 1917, as dramatically fewer fish returned from the sea to spawn. Later, the U.S. and Canadian governments would restore the salmon runs by creating a fish ladder through the Hell's Gate blockage, but that couldn't save the fish traps of Puget Sound. The declining resource and the Great Depression combined to drive the Puget Sound salmon industry to its knees. For the trap men, the knockout blow was delivered by the passage of Initiative 77 in 1934, which outlawed virtually all forms of fixed gear. Only the reef net was spared. Helgi Thorderson was a reef net fisherman more than 50 years ago. Fish uh, generally came in schools. It's kind of strange how they, like king salmon or springs, they called them up there, were 40, 50 pounders, and we would get uh, 50 cents a piece for the white ones and a dollar a piece for the red ones. And they were pretty wiry fish, and uh, it usually took a sockeye or a humpy to lead them in. And they would follow the humpies or the sockeyes. Uh, spring salmon traveling by themselves are kind of wiry and kind of hard to catch. And just a shadow from the man on the, on the perch would scare them, and they'd be gone. It'd be the last you'd see of them. So it was fun just watching for salmon. With the demise of the Puget Sound trap industry, the trap men headed for Alaska, where traps endured until the passage of statehood in 1958. To fish the deep waters of the southeastern Alaska panhandle, where piles couldn't be driven all the way to the seabed, the trap men devised floating traps. Floating traps were constructed on the beach, then towed to the fishing location. Each trap had to be precisely surveyed, then installed with its lead oriented across the currents that carried the fish. Position the trap even slightly off the mark and it wasn't likely to catch many fish. Gunderson understood the problem. We had one trap at, uh, at Lucky Cove, when I was at Fidalgo. She would drag anchor and, uh, and we had Finally ended up with put three five ton anchors on the head side when the storm would come. That trap could drag fifty feet and she had quit the fishing. So they have to be right. While the floating trap predominated in southeast Alaska, the Puget Sound pile trap persisted in central and western Alaska. As far as fishing is concerned, why oh, for long and big fishing, those piling traps could be the floater, hands down. And when I worked with Fidelco, I happened to look through their books one time, and and the slate, the um, Kings Mill trap got 700,000 fish that year. The Alaska traps were productive, but there were unique hazards like icebergs. Phil Haston followed the traps to southeast Alaska. The icebergs come out at Glacier Bay, you know, and you ain't stopping them. They got into the lead, ran into the lead. Well, the anchor's cables was good enough and anchored to the shore <clears throat> that held them, so the icebergs sit there and ra raise the lead up in the air. So <laughs> anyhow, you had to wait till the tide changed and it melted a little. It was a good thing it didn't turn over. Because every while, once in a while, them jokers will turn over. Yet another form of fixed gear in Alaska was the hand trap. Because these traps required extensive tide flats at low water, they were especially well suited for Cook Inlet. Once called Alaska's fish czar, former state Senate President Clem Tillian worked on the Cook Inlet hand traps. I was a young man with a dory. Uh, I'd been fishing halibut 
out uh, during that season, but then Oscar Dyson, my skipper, went for salmon, and I was left looking for a job, and Squeaky Anderson offered me one on a fish trap that he'd contracted with uh, Athabascan village of Tyonic to put in. It was all administered by old chief Chickalution, who ran the village somewhat in a dictatorial manner, to the be uh, village's benefit, I might say. So I went up there, and I was on a hand trap, which is different from the other ones you'll see in this uh, program, in that the stakes were driven by hand, the poles were stood up by hand, and the guy lines were, that held it were guide each way. Other than that, it worked basically the same as the other traps, except that it had to be put in at low water, uh, and only in Cook Inlet were they used extensively. Like most Alaskans, Tillian was troubled by the traps. Many of the canned salmon people uh, uh, said our fish when they spoke. And the Alaskans actually considered that these people were the owners of the fish. And therefore, they had no hesitancy uh, about treating them much the way the Irish would treat English-owned property before the breakup. They robbed the streams, they stole anything they could, they robbed the traps, and it was considered a patriotic duty. If you fought the canned salmon industry, you were showing that you were an Alaskan. And so the hatred of the traps was not just so much the fact that they were taking too much, which could have been controlled, uh, but that they were owned and operated by people that did not live in the territory. And they left nothing behind except their debris and so uh, you know we have now built the salmon runs of Alaska back to the largest they've been since we purchased it from Russia in 1867 and it was a mental changeover the day we became a state and had management of fisheries uh, even the constitutional convention gave the management biologist powers that no other state in the United States gave to theirs. Uh, when we want to shut an area down, we just flat shut it down, and we don't talk about buying fishermen out or buying lodges out. The fish come first. And the Alaskans were very proud of this, and so it switched at statehood only a, and the outgoing of the traps almost from a, we're stealing their fish and that's our patriotic duty to these are our fish, and anybody that goes up a creek or takes one illegal is ostracized by the other fishermen. Traps are unacceptable in Alaska today, not because they are not a good method of harvesting a resource, but because they were the symbol of a colonial empire. Gunderson, the former trap man, agrees that ownership was the problem. There's nothing wrong with the fish traps, it's just the people who own them. And that, that was the whole thing in a nutshell. The wrong people owned them. As in Puget Sound, piracy in Alaska was once a common practice that could be deadly. Mike Goodman saw the result. I, I had a cruiser, and we went up to, to this trap to see what the fishing was like. Stop and talk to the gentleman and see how good the fishing was. And when I got there, I couldn't see no man. There was no man on the trap. His boat was there, and his cap was laying on the little porch out in front of his shack. And I looked around, I hollered, and knocked on the door, and opened it up, and the man was gone. So I called the company that owned this trap, and I says, I'm here alongside your trap. And I says, there's, there's no man aboard. So they says, it can't be. He must be someplace. And I says, well, all right, he is, but he, this, this is the story you now. So they asked me to stay there for a while, and I did. And they brought in a, a plane, and sure enough, somebody had lifted all the fish out of the trap and killed a guy. Gunderson and his brother watched the family traps. If you were like my brother, you couldn't have a better job than that. He used to stand by the pot tunnel, and, and then they'd come up, and they'd get in, and of course, then they'd circle quick and go back. So he'd stand there with a rope on the tunnel sticks and uh, see the puppies go up and their little white faces come up there. 
why he would jerk this rope and drop the tunnel back on one side, and so they would pour in the, in the pot. The Gunnersons had their share of visits from the night buyers. We had, we was laying alongside a trap one time, and the fellow come up and he says, well, how about selling some fish? And he says, well, no, how much you paying for him? Oh, I don't know, five dollars a thousand or something like that. And we told him, well, gee, we can repay this a lot more than that. And he says, oh. <laughs> According to Tillian, trap piracy sometimes led to respectability. Some of the big tycoons in the fishing industry today uh, uh, definitely got their start in what you might call illegal manners. Uh, remember, robbing fish traps was almost a patriotic duty of an Alaskan if he could get away with it. When the season was over, the trap men came back to civilization. After long months of isolation, they often sought a release. Phil Haston remembers. Oh, well, I can tell you stories about the buggers that used to get drunk, too. <laughs> she got back to catch a can one time. They had six months, never get nothing. And them scan the hoovers were really dry. So we goes up town and some of us young buggers were only in their teens, really twenties, and them old buggers, they were really dry. Oh man. So <laughs> come down this one guy, he worked on the gear scout crew in the spring of the year, building them floating traps. And then they used them for trap watchmen or something in the summertime, you know. So anyhow, he was ahead of us, and we pulled up there in the taxi cab, and a bunch of us got out, and he'd come down by himself in his chassis cab, and he had a checkered coat on. I'll never forget that. Well, us kids was running and catching up, and <laughs> we got up with him, and he goes down the ladder, and he looks up to see who was coming. <laughs> Jesus. He backed right over. Overboard he went. And down he went. Jesus, me and another kid, we tore down there quick, and... <laughs> jerked him out. As soon as we got him on the dock, he said, son, never gone, I lost me whiskey. <laughs> well, what the <laughs> hell, it was plenty of whiskey. We entered and anchored up behind Mary Island, and I had to take the tender out of there the next morning, because that was the only, <laughs> me and the engineer were the only sober buggers. <laughs> son, never gone, I lost me whiskey. <laughs> The salmon trap era marked a unique period in the histories of the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. The traps are gone now, but the memory of this remarkable fishing style lives on. <laughs>